everybody. So my name is Jesse. I am your virtual adventure guide here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And I understand we have a lot of kids today who have never joined us for a broadcast before. And so welcome to the program. That's a big frog in my throat. We're going to take the frog out. There we go. He's gone. Oh, sorry about that, folks. <laughs> if you are joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through like 40 live free interactive broadcasts every single month. And so a huge welcome to all of you as we dive in with our second full week of programs. We had the chance to hang out with Greg Nance yesterday, who ran across the U.S. Last week, we got the chance to hang out with wildlife filmmakers at National Geographic, learn about sharks with OceanWise, and go across the Pacific Ocean with Airden Erich. So it's been a really adventurous start to the school year. Now, before we dive in with today's topic, I do want to note that we have a kahoot for you guys between our talk and our Q&A. So if you want to open this up as a separate tab in your computer live with us or on YouTube, feel free to do that now and I will share that pin at the end. Now there are a few groups that have joined us like a gazillion times, like 30 plus broadcasts over the years. And today I'm thrilled to be joined again by Megan McGrath at the Duke Lemur Center. So the Duke Lemur Center does incredible work to conserve, to do research on, to educate the public about the majesty of lemurs, the threats that they face, and how people like you can help. So I'm thrilled today to hang out with Megan, go live to the lemur forest at the Duke Lemur Center, and learn a little bit more about these incredible creatures. So Megan, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so glad to be back at the end of our busy tour season here. It's always nice to do a few broadcasts. Um, and I'm out here this morning in natural habitat enclosure number three. We have now 10 of them here at the Lemur Center. And basically a natural habitat enclosure is where our lemurs get to free roam in a forest. We have fences that keep them in. We'll go over exactly how it all works. But basically, I know you're not here this morning to see me. I just wanted to pop in to say hello um, and show you that these lemurs are endangered animals. And yes, we are still wearing masks around them just to be extra safe. Uh, as far as we know, conceivably, yes, lemurs can get COVID, but none of our over 200 lemurs have, and we want to keep it that way. So I'll be behind the camera. I'm going to go ahead and switch my settings so that you can see who you came here to see. All right, there we go. So now you can see our lemurs who are being a bit of couch potatoes this morning. We've got a family of cockerel shafak right here. And then we've also got a family of blue-eyed black lemurs. They're a little hard to see right now because they're being what I like to call building trolls, where they are hanging out right next to the building. So I'm going to try not to move too quickly because I know it can be a little disorienting with video when we go really fast in a circle. So this is the fence line I was talking about. We've got a fence with a net at the top. That net has a little bit of an electrical pulse, not enough to hurt them ba badly, but just enough to kind of feel annoying like a bee sting. So the lemurs learn not to touch it. And then we have that fence going all the way around. We also have a surprise extra primate. That's Layla, one of our research assistants out here. She's actually waiting on some lemur poop, believe it or not. We'll explain why in a moment. And then you can see the rest of the forest here. And then we've got our fence over there. So in just a few moments, their keeper is going to be coming out. Their caretaker is going to be coming out to feed them. And that'll hopefully encourage them to go back out into the rest of this three acres of habitat that they have access to. But they are right now really focused because they know breakfast is coming. So I will start with our lemurs who are easier to see. I will start with our cockerel shafak. And actually, let me back up. Let me start even further back than that. Let's start a little bit more about why there's over 200 lemurs living in Durham, North Carolina. So uh, Jesse gave us a great introduction. The Duke Lemur Center does important work conserving and protecting and educating folks about lemurs. We've been doing that for over 55 years now, and we have the most species of lemur that you're gonna find anywhere in the world outside of Madagascar. And these two species that, we're join that are joining us today are actually two of the most rare species to find outside of Madagascar. Um, you'll see a lot more of probably everybody's favorite lemur, the lemur they all know well, the ring-tailed lemur. That's the one you find in all the zoos all over the place. But there's actually 108 species of lemur living in Madagascar. And there are 12 species of lemur living here at the Duke Lemur Center. And one of the most unique species is these cockerel shafak right here. So in this family, we need a moment to tell who is who. Okay, so we've got Lupicina hanging out right here. And she is hanging out with her host impatiently waiting for breakfast. And then I might have to wait for their keeper to know exactly who is who otherwise, because Lupicina is the only one with a really helpful collar to help me tell them apart. 
oh, perfect. The researcher's helping me out because of course, when you're researching here and you're waiting for things like behaviors or feces from an animal, you got to know who's who. So Camilla is very easy to tell apart. She is right here, right in front of us. She's littler than everyone else. She's less than a year old. And then it looks like we have Felix there. Okay. I might need a moment to tell Felix and Gabe apart. Felix is the older brother of Camilla, and then Gabe is the dad. So it takes me a moment sometimes to tell them apart. Um, you might be seeing a few fun behaviors right now. Right now, Lupicina is doing some scent marking. That is a very important behavior for lemurs. They use a lot of their nose power to tell about the world around them. So it looked like she was rubbing her butt on there, but actually she has a scent gland. And the scent gland is a special spot that only smells like Lupicina. And then right after that, we have who I'm assuming is Gabe. Yeah, that's dad, Gabe, marking right behind her because he's got to make sure the next lemur that comes along and smells that knows that Miss Lupicine is not single and she does have a boyfriend. He wants to make sure everybody knows. And then we've got older brother Felix just leaped over to the building and showed you one of the most amazing things about these cockerel shafak. They can leap a good 20 feet in a single bound from tree to tree, but they always stay upright like this. They're bipedal. And I think you know a few other animals that are bipedal. We are too. So we are two-footed, bipedal. And so are these shafak. But instead of walking one foot in front of the other on the ground, they're going to hop around through the trees instead because that's where gonna, they're going to feel the most safe. All right. I am going to pause and come this way so you might be able to see them a little better without a glare. I'm going to make sure our blue-eyed black lemurs don't mind me coming this direction. Looks like we're okay. There we go. So you've got another good view of them. So a group of lemurs is called a troop, and that's everybody who lives together, usually in a small family. For these species, you're going to see mom, dad, and a few offspring, a few of their sons and daughters. And usually once the sons and daughters hit mm, around three, four, or five years old, then you're going to see them move out on their own and start their own family with their own babies. And then we have the same thing with our blue-eyed black lemurs down here. So blue-eyed black lemurs are really unique because they have bright blue eyes. So unlike us, some of us have blue eyes, some of us have brown eyes, the blue-eyed black lemurs always have blue eyes but the boys are all black, like Brady over here. He's the youngest, he's a few years old. And then his mom, Lee, right here, she's orange. So that's how you can tell she's a girl. And then we have dad, Quinn. He's got a collar on that helps us tell him apart. He's over there. So when you have a lemur species or any species where the boys and girls are two different colors, I've got a really good vocab word I can teach you. That is called sexual dichromatism. And that means that the two different sexes, the males and females, or boys and girls, are dichromatic. Di meaning two and chroma meaning color. So we've got two different colors between the boys and the girls here. You can see it really well. So that is extra helpful. It took me no time to tell this family apart. In the wild in Madagascar, these species wouldn't live anywhere near each other. They would actually live a couple hundred miles away from each other. Um, not too far away compared to some other species, but Madagascar is a huge island. It's actually the fourth largest island in the world. And so for a reference for those of us in North America, it would go about the bottom of Maine to the top of Florida and be about the width of California the whole way down. So it's a huge, huge island, mostly in the tropics. And if you're a cockerel shafak, which is our bouncy friends right here, you're going to live in the northwestern deciduous forest. Here's another really good vocab word. Some of you might already know this word. Deciduous just means that the leaves fall off the trees when the seasons change. So we have a lot of deciduous trees here in North America as well. And then we also have our blue-eyed black lemurs, and they would live in the primary forest a hundred miles or so, maybe a little bit more away, still in northern Madagascar, but more towards the center of the island. So lemurs can live in lots of different habitats. You've also got lemurs like the ring-tailed lemurs who can live way down in the south in the spiny forest, which is a desert-like climate that can be really harsh. And then you've also got lemurs who live in tropical rainforests on the east coast. And they've all got these amazing different adaptations and ways to survive out there. And one of the ways that the cockerel shafak has adapted to their environment in those deciduous forests 
is they have that bouncing motion that they do where they're going to bounce from side to side and move back and forth on their hind legs. And when they do that, they're going to usually land kind of sitting like this, kind of like Gabe is right here. And so you can see we've got our feet and our hands kind of facing the post sitting here. And that is really, really useful when you live in a deciduous forest, because if you've ever been in a forest like that before, the trees are kind of far apart. There's not a lot of overlap in the leaves on top in that canopy layer. So oh, I'm going to move us this way so we stay out of their way. We'll look at the forest for a second to give them a chance to get settled. So we'll look at this forest up here. You can see we've got lots of these little tree trunks, but there's not a lot of overlap. You can see a lot of sky coming through up there. That means that it's harder for the lemurs to go up to the tops of the trees and just walk across the branches to the other parts of the forest. So instead, the shafak in the deciduous forest have adapted to leap between those trunks and be able to land easily so they don't have to rely on that sparse canopy layer. And now we're at our most exciting part of the day. We have Catherine, their keeper here, and she's got a bucket full of food. And now the lemurs are interested in the forest again. There we go, we've got everybody going along. You're seeing those unique ways that they move. And I'll go ahead and follow behind. Apologies if my cinematography doesn't stay as smooth as it could. I'll try to be as good as possible and then we'll stay still again when we get out to the feeding site. All right, so now you can see them still a little bit. I know it's hard to see when I'm moving. I promise we'll stop in just a moment. I'll pause so you can see them just in the distance leaping through the trees and on the ground. All right, I'm gonna try to go a little quicker so I can pause again ahead. Here we go, so you can see them moving. So we're just arriving at their feeding site. They're always fed in the same location out here in the forest. That way Catherine gets a good look at everybody. Make sure they're all feeling okay this morning. We're in a three acre forest, so Catherine needs to reliably be able to find everybody. And I'm going to, I know where the lemurs are going in a second. So I'm going to get a little bit ahead of them and turn around the camera so you can see them coming at us. So give me just a moment. We're going to get over to where the Shafak get their breakfast. And we're going to show you a great view of them hopping over to us. Okay. So we're gonna hang here and wait. I promise it'll be worth the wait because these two species get along great out here, except for at breakfast time. At breakfast time, the blue-eyed black lemurs actually bully the much larger shafak lemurs and try to steal their food. So our feisty little blue-eyed black lemurs get to go in a smaller space back there to have their breakfast so everybody can eat their breakfast in peace and everybody's okay at the end of breakfast time. Um, and they don't mind at all. They actually get their favorite treats when they get to go into this area. But we've got an older gentleman in that family. And sometimes he takes his time, Quinn the dad. And he needs to be separated for his own breakfast, actually. Because if anybody knows who's in charge in lemur families, it's actually the girls. So we have to make sure that when we have older gentlemen in the lemur families and the lemur troops, in the wild, they might get left behind. They might not get as much food as they should. But here, they can get plenty of food because Catherine can be careful and make sure that everybody gets what they need. And it looks like the lemurs are giving Catherine a little bit of trouble this morning with going into their little area. Nothing she can't handle, but it might be a good moment for anybody who has questions. Oh, no, nope. I think Catherine's coming over here to feed the Shafak. Never mind, we're adjusting. Here's our view. Everybody get ready to watch them bounce on over. Look at those amazing leaps that they're doing. So they're called vertical leapers and clingers because they leap while they stay vertical. So their shoulders stay above their hips, just like ours do when we move. But they actually leap horizontally. So they're gonna leap horizontally between those trees. Oh, there's another really good leap. 
All right, so I will reintroduce who we've got here. We've got baby Camilla right here. We've got, I think, yep, dad and Gabe. So Gabe is dad, and then Felix is older brother. They're sharing a basket over here because remember, girls are in charge. So these two have to share their own basket out of the girl's way. Back by baby Camilla. And then this is mom, Lupithina. And you'll see mom lets me get right up here to see her because we don't ever touch our lemurs, cuddle them, pet them, anything like that. So Lupicina doesn't think of me as another lemur. And that's a great thing because Lupicina is the dominant female in this group. If she saw me as another lemur, she might think I was trying to steal her food. She might try to chase me off or do something like that that she will with another lemur. So it's always important to remember lemurs are wild animals. We are not. So we want to let them be wild. And that way she doesn't mind at all that I've come over here to watch her eat her big hunk of what looks like sweet potato this morning. She looks like a very good treat. All right. I think I will pause because I've given you a lot of information and see if maybe it might be time for questions or quiz. Yeah. Well, Megan, this has been spectacular. <laughs> like truly, I know that our kids, are, uh, you know, they're new to this whole thing, but uh, that was one of the best amounts of jumping and, and story we've ever had in one of these broadcasts in the forest. So thank you so much for that. And a, a huge thank you to our stars of the show, the lemurs as well. Um, yeah, let's dive in with our Kahoot quiz and then we'll dive in with Q&A. So put those thinking caps on, kids. If you have any questions for us, we'll be ready for questions in just a minute. But I know a lot of you are ready in our Kahoot. And so, Megan, if you want to help us out uh, as we dive in with the Kahoot with a few seconds in every one of our questions... We will take any assistance we can get, but we've got 53 people, 54 people in so far. For those who are new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. Now you don't win anything, but you do win Megan and I's everlasting respect if you win this, okay? And there's even some lemur names in our Kahoot, which is very exciting. So I'm gonna dive in and start, and then we are gonna get underway with questions after that. All right, three, two, one till our first question. We're going to head to Tatamagoosh for our first question in a minute as well. But here we go. Lemurs live on which island? Megan did say this. It was casual. It was near the beginning. Is it Borneo, Madagascar, New Guinea, or Dominica? Hmm. Eight seconds. I think there's a film that might help them out a little, Megan. I think Famous. there might be. And there might be a, a line about, I like to move it, move it in that film. There might be. Yes. Almost everyone got this right. Way to go. Good job, guys. See, movies are, are killing it. Okay. Space Otter is in our lead. Going into number two. Here we go. Chipakas can jump how far? So is it five feet, 10 feet, 15 feet, or 30 feet? Now, we got the chance to see this happen, which is wild. I mean, like, I, it's so rare to have such elegant animal interactions in a broadcast, and to be able to see them coming toward you is really quite... It and I think it might be more than people think. Yes. 58, how many people? A nice mix, you guys weren't really sure, but 20 to 30 feet. So Megan had mentioned 20, some of the other research up to 30, but like, it's incredible. Think about how far you can jump, maybe five feet from standing, six feet if you've got really powerful legs, and the lemurs have you beat by a huge margin. Mighty gliders in our lead now, okay? Two more questions, and then we are gonna go to our Q&A. How many kinds of lemur are there? So we've had the chance to meet a couple today. Is it three? Three kinds of lemur in the world? 20? About 100 kinds of lemur or 3,000 kinds of lemur? A lemur popping out of every drawer in Madagascar. Well, I think we can probably rule out one of them, right? Because I think I've already mentioned more than one of the options on this I, broadcast. I think you have. I'm, oh, and more people have joined, which is great. 65 answers. So I, nice even mix, but... 100 was our most popular answer. That is correct. About 100 kinds of lemur. There's a little debate over whether it's a few fewer or a little bit more, but I love the uh, accuracy. You guys are great. All right. Now, this is a multi-select. How can you help lemurs? We haven't really dove in too much of this, but I want your thoughts. Visit them. If you go see lemurs in the wild or the Duke Lemur Center, donate. Can you choose sustainable products or walk to school? And there might be more than one answer here. There might be several. Yeah. And I think it's important to remember that not every answer has to directly do with the lemurs. It might just help the environment we all live in. Yes, that is a very good point. <laughs> so all of these answers are correct. At least 10 of you got our, our walk to school one too. So again, walking to school, doing anything to help climate change. Climate change is impacting every ecosystem on this planet. The more that you do to reduce your emissions, the better you are. 
choose sustainable products. This is something that's of real interest in Madagascar and a lot of island habitats around the globe. There's only so many spaces. So if you work with companies or buy things that have been taken in a sustainable way, it really helps protect those habitats. Visiting creatures as an ecotourism thing always works to help protect them because it means that people value the animals even more and donate of course. There's so much great work being done by the Duke Lemur Center in Madagascar broadly. Uh, we've done many broadcasts on the conservation work they do there and it really does go a long way to helping protect these awesome creatures. So, Classy Lobsters third, Royal Lion second, and first, for all the marbles, before our Q&A, is Genius Squid, who basically won wire to wire, which is very impressive. So, way to go, Genius Squid. Bravo, let us know who you are in the chat. Um, and we're going to head to Miss Reed's class. So, Miss Reed's group is joining us today in Tatamagusha, Nova Scotia. Uh, so nice to have you guys here with us. Unmute your mic and come on in and ask Megan any question you want about lemurs. Hi, guys. Hi, we have a question here. Lemurs are endangered. Lemurs are endangered. Why is it important to keep them around? What happens if they die? Yes. That's an excellent question. And I think one that not a lot of people take the time to ask. So that's a really good one. And I think there's two really important reasons we can talk about why it's important to protect lemurs and their habitat. And one has to do with the island of Madagascar in general. It's an incredibly important place with so much biodiversity, meaning so many different species found in that one spot. And in fact, most of the species living in Madagascar of plants, birds, other animals, all of those animals, most of them are only found on the island of Madagascar and nowhere else in the world. So if we lose these animals in the wild in Madagascar, we're gonna lose them in the wild for, for good if we, if we can't figure out a solution. And the other reason it's really important to study and protect lemurs is that they are primates and we are also primates. So lemurs are the representation of the branch of primates that went off in a different direction a long, long time ago. So they're from the earliest branch of the primate family tree from tens of millions of years ago. We estimate probably around like 55 million years ago is when they started branching off, which is right around the beginning of the age of mammals. So we can actually learn about ourselves as primates by studying these other smaller primates. Great question, guys. Way to kick us off with that one. I like that, Miss Reed's class. Uh, Miss Siemens class, joining us in Miami, Florida, third graders. Come on in. Hey, guys. Wait, say hi. 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 Is that all excited? One. Let's go. Okay. Manny's going to ask, which, pick one of the questions. Hey, Manny. How old can they live? How old can they live? Yeah. A great question. And for a lot of these questions, it's going to depend on which lemur I'm talking about. So I'm going to answer just about these Shafak right in front of us. And these guys can live into their 20s and sometimes their early 30s, but that's a really long life for a Shafak. For some species, it's going to be shorter or longer. Um, and also it can change whether an animal lives in the wild or here as well. So there's lots of different ways it could go. But I'm going to say just for these animals right in front of us, they're probably going to live at least into their 20s. Perfect, which is actually pretty substantial for a mammal. For something their size, too, that's not very common. I mean, I think some of us are used to dogs and cats tend to be about the 10, 15 range. And so for a smaller animal to have that long a lifespan is very impressive. Cool question, guys. All right, Miss Collins class. Uh, I know it's two groups together joining us in Rhinebeck. You guys are good to go. Hi. Hey! Hey! Um, How much do you like? Hey, it's me. OK, go me. ahead. Ask um, up to how many babies do lemurs have? Yeah. Another excellent question. And it's another one that depends on the species. As we were saying, there's a hundred different species. They can be as small as a mouse, literally called mouse lemurs, all the way up to about a foot taller than the Shafak we're seeing here. That's a lemur called the Indri. That's very cool. Um, and so you've got a lot of variation in their size, where they live, and also sometimes how many babies they can have. So for this lemur right in front of us, they're going to have a single baby at a time. Lots of other lemurs who are active during the day or diurnal are going to have about one baby, maybe twins at a time, except for the ruffed lemurs. If you've ever seen a red ruffed or a black and white ruffed lemur, they can have up to six babies, actually, and they'll build a nest instead of carrying their baby around with them. So lots of variation depending on which lemur. But for these ones, just one baby. Very, very cool. You mentioned the Indri in there, and I always say this in every broadcast we have with you guys, but I encourage every single class, when you're done this session, go look up the Indri and listen to their call on YouTube. This is one of the most hauntingly beautiful things in all of nature. Great question, guys. All right. Our Virtual Academy, Madam Jen's class, joining us in Ontario. If you have one for us, come on in. Hey. 
Hi, so they actually have quite a few questions. Um, as lemurs live in group, what happens if the dominant lemur dies? Oh, excellent question. So with any change in the social group, it's it's going to be just like us. It's going to really depend on the individuals. So in a family like this, if something suddenly happened to Lupicina, which don't worry, that won't happen. She's very young and healthy and doing great. Um, I think it would immediately default to Camilla, even though she's so young, she would become the dominant female because females are always in charge. If you have a bigger, more complicated family group, like say with ring-tailed lemurs, you can actually have multiple moms and their babies living together. Then it might get a little bit more complicated. It would super depend on the individuals living in that family. So just because we usually see moms in charge and that's about it, doesn't mean you can't see some variation in terms of who's in charge and who's not. Um, in the past, when we've had an older female that passed away, um, usually it was her oldest daughter um, that took over the tree. Very cool question, Madam Jen. I, I, you know, it's very rare that we get questions along the lines of sort of succession in animal societies. There's a whole BBC series that I loved from a few years ago called Dynasties. And so if you get the chance to check this out from a library, buy it if you're so inclined. Uh, some really cool stuff in there with a variety of species about exactly that happening. So like if something passes away, how does that affect the dynamic of the group of animals? And some really, really interesting stuff. Uh, all right. Two other questions with our live groups. We'll take some from YouTube after that and do a second round. Megan, as usual, you are whipping through these and it's awesome. Uh, but Miss Fisher's class joining us in Mishawaka, Indiana. If you guys want to unmute your mic and bring your insane level of enthusiasm to the broadcast. Well, here we are. Hi. <laughs> Oh, so this is a great question, and I'm going to be a teeny bit nitpicky with you. I don't mean to pick on you, but if you want to ask if lemurs are poisonous, that's actually asking if if I eat a lemur, will I get sick? So I'll answer both if lemurs are poisonous and if they're venomous, which I think is more often the question people are asking. Venomous means that if they bit me or scratched me, would I get sick? So in both cases, no. Lemurs are not going to make you sick in either way. They're not poisonous. They're not venomous. There is a really cool little primate that is related to lemurs. It's in that early, early group of, lemur, of primates with lemurs called the loris. There are slow lorises and slender lorises. Um, I know that Jesse can go ahead and put a name up for you in the chat of that species. Um, definitely look them up. They are actually a venomous primate. They're really cool and unusual, but no lemurs are venomous or poisonous. Cool question. I don't think we've ever had that one before. So lorises are awesome. Do look them up. The other venomous mammals in the world, there's something called the Selenodon, which almost no one's ever seen a picture of. They look like a weird opossum-type creature. They live on the island that has uh, Dominican Republic and, and Haiti on it. Uh, and platypus have a venomous spur near the back of their things on the males. So there's not very many venomous mammals, and that's a very rare question. So thanks, Mr. And there's actually one that lives here in North Carolina, the short-tailed shrew in North Carolina. So this is interesting because when I was looking at venomous mammals to confirm all this, I'd heard of that, but I'd never heard of that in my life. So very, very cool. So if you go to North Carolina, you can go see the lemurs, which are not venomous, but hang out with the shrews, which are. That's our, our call to action for our classes. Uh, Mr. Sahadio's class, welcome in, guys, who join us today in lovely Peterborough. If you have a question for us, come on in. Hey, guys. Oh, yes. Hi. Hey. Hi. <laughs> uh, we have a question. Come on up. Sorry. Take your time. No hurry. <laughs> Um, why do girls always have to rule the past? Yes. Great question. So we think there's a couple of factors, but one of the big ones is that boy and girl lemurs are the exact same size. They have the same size teeth, the same size muscles. They're about as tall as each other. They weigh about as much as each other. And if you don't have a difference in the size of the boys and the girls, there's not as much motivation for the boys to be in charge. When you start seeing boys in charge in primates is when you get into some monkeys and mostly apes. And so if you look at, say, a gorilla, there's a very big size difference between the boys and the girls. Same thing with something like a baboon. You're going to see a really big difference between the boys and the girls. And so that boy then takes on the role of being the protector of his family. And so then he's in charge because he's kind of in charge of security. His job is to keep everybody safe and kind of make the rules. In lemurs, the boys and girls are the same exact size. So they can be equally good at defending their turf. 
at fighting off any intruders, anything like that. So in that case, the mom is going to be the one who needs to have all the best food and have the safest places to rest and sleep because she's the one who's going to be growing babies in her belly. So if she's going to be getting pregnant and she's going to be eating for two or three, depending on how many babies she has, she's going to want to be the safest. She's going to want to be- get the best possible food into her belly so that she can eat lots of really tasty and healthy things. And so it makes sense that she would then be in charge so she can make sure she gets all that stuff. I love that question. That was a very detailed answer, Megan. And I, I want to stress for our classes, we get this question in a variety of different programs with live animal folks. And lemurs are, are this sort of rare mammalian example where females are, are bigger and therefore sort of the dominant ones. In the animal kingdom on the whole, whether it's insects, fish, reptiles, females are classically larger. So most groups of animals in the world, females are larger than males. And so it's just sort of a perspective shift from a lot of us, our, our students today. But I'm really glad we got the chance to get that question in. Um, Megan, you're good to go for another round of questions? Yes? Yeah, I am. Well, let's head to Ms. Matsuba's class. Alex, uh, joining us in Spruce Grove, Alberta, wants to know, is there a most popular color for lemurs to be? What's their favorite fashion to know? What uh, is their most uh, common, I guess, coat color? That's a great question. I, I, I want to preface this by saying I have not seen all 108 species of lemur. So I'm going to go based off of those that I have seen. And I'd say one of the most common colors you'll find is some shade of brown is pretty common in a lot of lemurs um, because you're going to see a lot of browns in the forest. So that's going to be a good way for them to blend in. And it's also pretty common for you to see some very slight color differences. Like we've got the brown and white here. Of course, you've got the black and white stripes on the ring-tailed lemur. Um, But even the ring-tailed lemur, they actually have a lot of brown in their gray coat that most people don't realize. So... I guess final answer, brown-ish. Yeah. <laughs> final answer, brown-ish. Um, I want to stress for our students, too, another thing you guys should look up, speaking of lemurs, we've already talked about the Indri today. Uh, uh, my favorite one to look at in terms of the color, I'm just pulling this up on a banner now, it's called the Silky Shifak or Shifaka. Uh, so check them out. They're really cool white. They're quite fascinating looking. They look sort of like ghosts flying through the, the forest. They're very cool. Um, Miss Reed's class, Tata Magoosh, if you guys want to come on back in, unmute your mic. You are good to go. Hey, guys. Okay, we have another question here. Nice. When lemurs are born, do they go back to Madagascar or do they stay at the Duke Center? Yeah, good question. Great question. So that question touches on something that in conservation we call reintroduction. Um, or there's there's other versions of this word like translocation, restocking. But basically, it's the idea that do the animals go back into the wild? And for a lot of us, that's an example we can think of, of like really good successful conservation with zoos in North America, like the black-footed ferret here in the States and in North America. Um, Or if we think about animals like the California condor, those are great examples of where restocking or reintroducing have gone really well. Reintroducing is a really tricky thing because you have to have certain conditions. You have to have enough room and enough food for those animals in the wild, but not enough of those animals. But in Madagascar, we don't have enough room and we don't have enough food for all the lemurs to have in their habitat. So reintroduction doesn't make sense in Madagascar right now. So the lemurs living here are what we call a safety net. We keep our lemurs as healthy as possible. Everybody who's having babies here is part of a breeding plan. We plan exactly who's gonna be the best dad and mom to have the healthiest babies and who's gonna keep our population really healthy long-term. The lemurs don't mind at all because they don't mind switching up and living with different times, kinds of lemurs because that happens all the time in the wild. And then that way, for a long, long time, while we work on getting more habitat and more food in Madagascar through our other conservation programs, mostly working with people in Madagascar, then we can eventually possibly look at reintroducing the animals. And at the very least, we have a safety net of them here. That's a really complicated issue. It was a great question. And I hope that made a little bit of sense. Yeah, it made a lot of sense. Miss Reed's class, you guys have been really on the ball today. Way to go with the research for these questions. Um, Miss Siemens' class, I'm sorry that your text giving you a little bit of trouble, but they want to know, Megan, do lemurs have predators? One of my very favorite questions we ever get to in these broadcasts. Absolutely, and I know you're ready with this name. So the lemur's predator is, is called a fusa, and so or a fus, uh, depending on exactly how good your Malagasy is. And so Malagasy is the language and the people of Madagascar, by the way. And so some of these names like Shifak and Fusa are going to be from that language. And the Fusa is kind of like if you mashed a mongoose and a kind of like, hmm, I want to say like an African golden cat, which is not a good reference, like a, a cat together. So a mongoose and a cat together. 
They're around eh, 30, 35 pounds or rusty brown color. Um, they've got a very mongoose-like face and they're excellent at climbing trees. Are you going to pull up a photo for us? There we go. Yes, there we go. <laughs> They're like a turbo lemur or a turbo, um, not lemur, <laughs> they're like a turbo weasel. Like they're like, they look very, they look vaguely sinister. They're one of my most sinister looking predators I've always felt. They look like they mean business. If I was a lemur, I wouldn't want to run into one of these in the woods. Yeah, absolutely. And I also want to bring up, because I am a big predator fan, that predators will interact with prey. And of course, a predator would be a threat to an individual lemur like these ones living here. They don't have to worry about Fusa. But Fusa are also critically endangered in Madagascar. So they are just as deserving as, of our protection as the lemurs are because they're all part of the same ecosystem. Yep, that's a very, very important note. I know that the two of us are people that like love predators and think that they're fantastic. And a lot of people sort of malign things that are eating other things, but they have just as much of a right to be there. They're just as spectacular and they're just as integral to their ecosystem. So I'm really glad we got that point in. Great question, Miss Siemens Group. All right, uh, Miss Collins, Miss Darby uh, class, hi, fifth graders. Come on yeah. back. Hi. Hey, hi. Hi. Yes, hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so my question is, how much food do lemurs eat a day? That's an excellent question. And since our keeper happens to still be here, I might uh, get her to help me out with this one. Again, we'll talk about this little lemur that's sitting right in front of you here, because when you have a lemur that's the size of a mouse, they're going to eat a very different amount of food. But for these cockerel shafak, let's talk about how much food they get a day. Do you happen sure. to remember like um, weights or brands or anything like that? Not off the top of my head. Okay, we can do estimates, yeah, right? Sure. So they're going to get three different main components of their diet. They're going to get a few different types of veggies, five in fact. Five, yeah. yeah, they're going to get beans or nuts for protein and they're going to get lemur chow. They get a full of or chow that's for leaf eating. It's just how much of each of those things are they getting? It's probably like, off the top of my head, I would probably say it's 50, 60 grams of chow. We changed diets recently also, so <laughs> that is complicating my It's okay, body. we can estimate. <laughs> Um, and then they're going to get more veggies than that, um, so probably veggies, um, a piece, and then about 10 grams of that for, um, Okay, great. So we're going to get somewhere between 150 to 200 grams of all those things every yeah. day for each lemur. In addition to all of the leaves that they eat on their own. Great point. The species loves eating leaves. They're going to eat kind of buckets full of leaves throughout the day. That is your, your call to action, students, to eat your vegetables, and you can maybe leap as far as a lemur if you continue to do that. I know Olympians are keen on vegetables as well. You just so have to grow an opposable big toe, and then you'll be set. Okay. <laughs> um, we've got a question uh, from YouTube, and then I'm going to head to Madam Jen and Miss Fisher's class for wrap-up. So in Miss Matsuba's class, uh, a sort of a double question. Avery wants to know if there are other animals that are vertical jumpers, and Lavinia wants to know if the lemurs ever fall when they're jumping between trees, which I think are great questions. <laughs> great. Two great questions. Um, the answer to the second one is, yeah, we trip. They'll stumble sometimes, too. Um, most of the time, the lemurs are really good at recovering, but occasionally they do hurt themselves in the wild, obviously. That could be that that lemur is no more if they fall and break a leg or something like that. But here we've got two full-time vets, two full-time vet techs on our regular staff to help make sure everybody's taken care of. Um, it's very rare that the lemurs fall and actually injure themselves, but occasionally they take a tumble, they slightly miss something. Um, they have their off days just like we do, especially when they're young. Babies tend to have a couple of falls as they're learning, just like we do. We stumble, um, you know, some of us have a permanent bruise on our head when we're a two-year-old learning to walk. Um, so the same thing. And then the first question about vertical leapers and clingers, vertical jumpers, yeah. that I know for a fact we have multiple species of lemur who do that. So we've got multiple species of shafak in the wild. We've also got the woolly lemurs and the indri and, I, and the sportive lemurs. They're all going to move with that vertical leaping and clicking. There is only one other creature that I found very readily that does it as well. It's also a primate. It's not a lemur. It's called a tarsier. And I really encourage everyone on their done to look up a tarsier skull. This is the freakiest skull in all of nature because their eyes are so huge. So this is like a little tiny creature that sort of leaps between trees and hunts insects. Uh, so again, related to us, it's a primate, but really, really spectacular animals. And I, I'm glad you brought up some other really cool lemur species as well. Great question, Ms. Matsuma's group. All right, Madam Jen and Ms. Fisher in that order. Come on in, Matt. Madam Jen, and take us away. <laughs> Hi. So in nature, are lemurs found anywhere else other than Madagascar? Great question. So technically, dwar uh, the mongoose lemurs are found in the Comoros Islands, which is a tiny little island chain right between 
northern Madagascar and Africa, but they were introduced there. They aren't naturally found there. We think that they probably made it over there when people made it over to the island. Other than that, nope, you're not going to find lemurs anywhere else in the wild. They don't naturally live anywhere else in the world but Madagascar. Again, that's why it's really important for us to help with our and do our part with conservation since islands are very threatened by climate change. Yep. Uh, Megan, you might know this a little better than I do. I know we've done some programs with you guys on fossil lemurs in the past. And to my understanding, lemurs did used to be on mainland Africa and monkeys sort of mm -hmm. displaced them. So lemurs only exist in Madagascar now because monkeys didn't make it there. But where monkeys evolved as well, they sort of took over from lemurs where they used to live. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's, that's some of the basics. Actually, the earliest examples of primates we see are in the northern continent. So we have a really excellent skeleton we found in Wyoming with our, our fossil crew here at the Lemur Center who are going to be doing some programs later this fall when the lemurs are not out in the forest during the cooler weather. Um, and from basically the Wyoming and kind of European areas, you see primates migrate down as the climate shifts over the millions of years and it gets warmer in other parts of the world. And then eventually primates make it into Africa. From there, they do what's called natural rafting. And that's how you get South American monkeys. They actually got carried over from a storm, got knocked over in a bunch of trees and carried over. And that's also how you get lemurs in Madagascar. They got knocked over in some trees, carried over on this natural raft to Madagascar. And just like you said, the lemurs happened to get to Madagascar where there were no other primates to compete with them. So they got to spread and expand all over the island um, and become all these diverse species you would see today where their relatives got outcompeted on the mainlands like Africa and North America. And I love this concept. It's something that I, I know when I was younger and I heard about natural rafting, I was like, there's no way. Like, there's no way that you have a bunch of vegetation and something's living on that and gets there. But we actually see this in action all the time. Uh, there's many, many recorded instances of snakes, lizards, things that are the same size as or even bigger than lemurs coming across on rafts of vegetation. Uh, out in certain oceans, you can find rather large uh, aggregations of things either blown from storms or that just collapsed into the water, uh, which can travel really, really far distances. In fact, Charles Darwin did a lot of experiments on this to see how far seeds could travel, how far eggs could travel for certain kinds of species. So it sounds a little outlandish, but it's a really, really common and well understood way that animals are transmitted between islands and continents in the past. So great point, Megan. All right, Miss Fisher's class, I'm coming back to Mishawaka. If you guys have one final question to wrap us up, come on in. Hey, guys. How do, why do male and female lemurs eat from each other? Yeah. Like, so I'm not sure I got that question. Yeah. So what do you mean? Like, the, why do they take food from each other or eat separately or what's the deal? Separately. Why do they eat separately, Megan? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that has to do with that dominance I was talking about. So when an animal is going to show their dominance or show they're in charge, one of the best ways they can do that is by deciding who can get what resource. And a resource is anything that is valuable to us, right? And one of the most valuable things to a lemur is going to be food. Food is the building block of their lives. They need food to have all this energy to bounce through the trees. So the dominant female is always going to be able to control who gets access to what food. So right here in front of us, we have our dominant female, Lupicina, and we have her daughter, Camilla. We've got the two girls together. And that is because girls are in charge. So if the male were to come over here, if the boy were to come over here, he would get chased off because as the dominant female, it's her job to keep everybody in line, make sure everybody survives and does well. And part of doing that is making sure everybody understands who's in charge. So he can't just come over here. We're going to pan up to dad, Gabe up here. He cannot just hop over and steal food from mom. That would ruin the whole structure of the whole organization. And that would make it so that nobody would listen to mom anymore and then they would have a, actually a lesser chance of surviving. I know it sounds kind of silly, like why doesn't he just grab the food, but it's really important to lemurs to the point that we actually sometimes have older lemurs like Quinn, the blue-eyed black lemur we met earlier, who are so good at staying with their family because they know that's what means survival. Stay with your troops, stay with your family. That if his family is done eating before he is and they wander off, He's going to wander off with them. He's not going to stay and get enough food because he knows it's so important to stay with his family to survive. So we separate him into a different room so that everybody gets the same amount of time to eat. Quinn gets extra time to eat all of his food before his family can decide they want to go venture off into the forest without him. 
Megan, uh, I always learn so much personally every time we do these broadcasts. This is fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much for all of this. I know we're nearing the end of the broadcast, so I want to make sure, again, all our students take the opportunity to check out lemur.duke.edu. You can learn about the incredible work that Megan and her team do to conserve lemurs, to educate the public about them. You can join us for our broadcast next week as we head back to the lemur forest or check out, I think, 30 plus programs on our YouTube channel. Many more to come throughout the year. Um, before we wrap up, Megan, and bring in all our classes, is there a final message you want to leave our students with today about lemurs? Yeah, absolutely. I think my main message is that I'm so excited that you joined us today. We've only touched the tip of the iceberg when it comes to lemurs. There's lots of other resources you can find, including on our website. There's a whole virtual tour video series that's a great place to get started. We've got videos about each different species, how we take care of them, all kinds of great stuff. So we've got some free stuff for you there. And we hope you'll join us again for a future Lemur Center broadcast with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Fantastic. Megan, thank you so, so much. As you know, what we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our teacher friends to say a big thank you and farewell. Now, classes, you guys not only had some of the best questions we've ever had today, but you were the most crazy enthusiastic. So I hope you'll join me. Uh, Miss Reed's class, Miss Siemens class, Miss Collins and Miss Darling, Madam Jen and Miss Fisher's class. Thank you so much.